So we're at uh, unit, what, what I'm calling unit three of this uh, particular uh, session here, Unlimited Growth, New Testament Pattern for Church Organization and Growth. And this particular lesson is entitled, A Biblical Plan for Growth. Here's a prayer I've never heard. Never heard this prayer. I mean, I've heard, like you, thousands and thousands of prayers, opening prayers, closing prayers, prayers for the sick, prayers before you eat, prayers before the Devo, prayers before the seminar, uh, lots of prayers. But this is a prayer, not once have I ever heard this prayer. It goes like this. Dear Lord, please shrink our church, we're way too big. <laughs> Never heard that prayer before. The problem has been, everybody wants the church to grow. I've heard that prayer a lot. Lord, please help us grow. Lord, please add to our number. You know, different ways of asking for the same thing. The problem is always, but how? How do you do it? What do you do to make the church grow? How do you sustain that growth? How do you maintain the church when it's big? And how do you do all of this? Here's the key without compromising scripture or losing the values and the spirit you enjoyed when you were a small congregation. What's the knock against big churches? Wow, well, they're so impersonal. You know. And yet, everybody wants to be a big church. You ever notice that? Nobody ever says, oh, I'd just love to take this church, plant a church in Ponca City and make sure it doesn't grow beyond 40 people. That way we could just be intimate. No, we always want it to be big. Then we complain when it's big that it's, well, wasn't it so wonderful when it was small? And yet we make no effort to shrink it down, back down to size again. So this is the, the subject matter and more importantly the challenge of this particular lesson this morning where we're going to try to understand the meaning of the title of this seminar. The title is Unlimited Growth, A New Testament Pattern for Church Growth, uh, Church Organization rather, and growth. It took me over 10 years to come up with that title. Now I've been working on church growth ideas and you know, the, you know, my, my major in college was actually uh, missions, uh, how to plant churches and how to develop and grow them. And yet I kept changing that title around all the time before I settled on this particular uh, title. So let's kind of go through it, shall we? First of all, Unlimited growth. In looking at churches and growth, I realized that the growth of the church was truly unlimited. Jesus said that the church was to be built on the rock of Christ and His word, and nothing, He said, nothing, including the most powerful force of evil, could overcome it. Matthew 16, 18. Okay. Well, here's the caveat. Sometimes growth is fast, sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's dramatic or painful or exciting, but in the end it was above all unstoppable. So our leader, Christ, has said to us the growth of the kingdom, the growth of the church is unstoppable, unlimited. Okay, that's, biblical. that's a biblical idea, that's not my idea. So every congregation therefore has the potential for unlimited growth and development. However, for various reasons, churches plateau at a certain number and they remain there indefinitely. Many of them do, some of them shrink back, some of them disappear. We talked about that last night. Unlimited growth, every congregation has the potential. A New Testament pattern, a New Testament pattern. I believe that it is both biblical and expedient to acknowledge and use the concepts developed primarily by restorationist thinkers and writers in the task of growing congregations. Restorationism, you know, we're of the restoration movement. We've got something to say about church growth. We've got something to say about that. We seem to think that the gurus at the fast growing community style churches, they've got all the answers for rapid church development. We drive by Life Church, you know, they've taken over a shopping center or something. We go, wow, look at those guys. They must be doing something right. What are we doing wrong? But you have to realize that many of their theories and practices, while contributing to the size of their organizations, they do damage to the integrity of the stewardship of God's word. 
And that's not just sour grapes. You know, if, if we go by numbers, right? If we go by numbers, the communist Chinese are right. If you want to go by numbers, they're right. They got the biggest numbers, I guess. Their theories are right, their politics are right, their approach is correct. Why? Well, they got the biggest numbers. Well, we don't use that when judging the value of a society or a political system. Why would we use that in judging the value of a church? It's an old argument, but nevertheless true, that sacrificing biblical purity and obedience for fast growth is not worth it, and it does not serve the best spiritual interests of the church. What did we say last night? Last night we said when Jesus returns, who's He looking for? The biggest church? He's looking for the faithful church. And again, that's not a kind of church of Christ idea, that's a biblical idea. So most of you are familiar with the idea of pattern theology. Pattern theology is the idea that the Bible uh, uh, contains and communicates in various ways, instructions and directions, patterns, if you will, that guide us in church organization, church function, and personal living and doctrine. Now, we like to think we initiated that idea, but that's not so historically. Even though this idea actually grew out of earlier concepts developed during the Reformation period, and today there are many challenging its value as an interpretive system, pattern theology continues to provide an excellent way to discern the simple meaning and the simple application of Scripture in a very practical and consistent manner. In other words, Let's not throw away pattern theology. Pattern theology is a great idea. It's a good idea. It's a good tool to do what we want to do. So you understand, are we clear when I'm talking about pattern theology that the Bible has patterns, blueprint if you wish, for how we ought to do things in all kinds of circumstances? That's pattern theology. Again, we talked about that last night. Now, I want to explain why this is a good idea. By using an example given to me by a military flight instructor who attended a congregation that I was preaching at in San Diego, California a few years back. He explained to me that planes, and again, some of you may be pilots, so please forgive me, I'm not in my area of expertise here. Well, he explained to me that planes, and even missiles for that matter, are not flown or launched in a perfect trajectory until they arrive at their destination. You know, it's not we launch the missile or we fly the plane and you know, it's at A and it just goes zoom straight to B. That's not, that's not the way that it works. The pilots using instruments and computers continually calculate a variety of factors and they make ongoing adjustments and corrections to the direction of the plane or the missile in order to compensate for weather and other factors that throw the plane or the missile continually off course. Uh, the, 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 the missile is traveling this way, the wind is going against it, it's, it's, you know, it's wanting to send the missile to the right or left, up or down, and the computers all right, manage to always bring it back on course so that it will eventually land at its targets. In other words, whether it be an instrument or the pilot, they are continually maneuvering to keep on course until they arrive. Well, in the same way, restorationism in general and its tool of pattern theology serve as a kind of a, a spiritual gyroscope or a gyrocompass to enable the church to continually correct its course and stay true to the goal of New Testament Christianity, which it chartered. We started out by saying we want to be a faithful New Testament church. How do we maintain that direction? Well, this thing called pattern theology helps us to keep a steady course as we go through history, as we go through different social milieus, as we go through different cultures. This pattern theology helps us stay on course so that we maintain a, a true path, a true faithful biblical path. It's a feature, and here's my point in all of this, it's a feature that is not found in other religious groups. It's a feature not, we're unique in that. We're not unique in the fact that we don't use instruments of music 
There are other groups that don't use instruments of music in public worship. What makes us unique is that we use, we use pattern theology okay, to remain faithful to the, to the scriptures. Yeah. So others do not have this spiritual gyroscope and as a result they continue to change, evolve, mutate into forms and shapes barely recognizable to their own founders and even their members, let alone the Bible. Do you think that Martin Luther would actually recognize the Lutheran church today? I mean, Martin Luther was the guy who got up and said, let's get back to the Bible. He, he wouldn't recognize what's there today. We, on the other hand, are consistently pressured to veer off in one direction or another. We get all shocked and nervous, you know, the church is veering, we're way to the left, oh my goodness, we're going to the left, you know, and then the lefties are saying, you people are conservative, you're legal, you're way to the right, you know, we, that's just normal. Just like a plane, you know, a plane just by virtue of the way that it's going is going to hit headwind, it's going to go against the wind, it's going to, you know, the wind's going to try to shift it. In the same way, culture, society, sin, human weakness, whatever, is going to try to shift the direction. What's our direction? Faithful New Testament church, that's our direction, that's the course we've plotted. And so pattern theology is that instrument in our spiritual equipment that helps us stay the course. We are continually called upon to abandon the road that we are on, but in all of this noise and clamor, in all of this worldly headwind, we can always consult our spiritual gyro compass to fix for ourselves true north and make the necessary corrections that will set us once again on the path of biblical Christianity and New Testament church construct. And yet, Still another way to say it, because of our restoration principles and pattern theology approach, we know where we're going, we know how to get there, and we know how to get back on course if for any reason we have veered off for a while. Now, I'm saying all of this to explain why I felt it important to mention in the title that unlimited growth for churches is possible because there is a pattern for this type of growth contained in the New Testament. I need to repeat that again in case you were writing or not you know, listening. Unlimited growth is possible for churches. Why? Because I say so? Because you want? No. It's possible because there is a pattern for unlimited growth here in the Bible. Just like there's a pattern for how do we take communion and how do we baptize people and how do we appoint elders and who should be elders and so on and so forth. You know, there's a pattern for that, a blueprint for that. I'm proposing to you that there is also a blueprint in the New Testament for church growth. And if we learn it and follow it, the growth that we seek will come. OK, good, amen? amen? All right. Now, I firmly believe that churches who are not poised for this type of growth and not experiencing it are the way they are because they're neglecting this principle. They just don't know it and they don't know how to apply it. Now, if you're interested in hermeneutics, okay, that's the science of or the discipline of biblical interpretation and pattern theology, I can recommend, and I think it's in your notes there, uh, an article by Thomas Ulbricht, uh, Hermeneutics in the Churches of Christ, a marvelous article. You can go online, just type that in and you'll get that article if you really want to go more deeply into the subject. I've only kind of summarized it here. All right, so we have unlimited growth, the New Testament pattern, the third reason for the title, uh, church organization, here we go, here we go, uh, church organization and growth. I think that there is a definite relationship between organization and the rate of growth. In other words, how you're organized affects how you grow. Okay? This relationship exists in business. 
Badly organized and managed businesses usually don't grow very much and are not very profitable. This relationship also exists in God's spiritual kingdom as well. If you think God doesn't care about organization, if you think God doesn't care about that, read the instructions about the building and the maintenance of the tabernacle in the desert. If you think that God doesn't care about organization, Every detail, every piece of furniture, every ritual meticulously organized and detailed to function perfectly, page after page after page after page of instructions to Moses how to build a tabernacle, how to move it from place to place, how to put it together, who handles what, who touches what, who doesn't touch, every detail is there. So think for a moment. If God provided such clear and concise detail for the organization and function of something that was only to be a shadow, only to be a model of the real thing, how much more careful do you think He would be with the real thing? That was just the shadow, that was just the preview. We're the real thing. The church is the real thing. Can you imagine how much care he gives in giving detail to how we ought to, you know, what we say, do church, organize church. So the church is the body, is the bride of Christ, not a shadow, not a symbol of it. And so I propose to you that in the New Testament God has provided a pattern for the organization and subsequent growth of the New Testament church. All right, so I want to say two things about this concept. In other words, the concept that I'm proposing to you is in the Bible there is a pattern for church growth. Okay? I want to say two things about that. First of all, there are many strategies for organizing and growing a religious group, but there's only one New Testament pattern. Don't believe me? Just go to any Christian bookstore. There's shelf, shelf after shelf of books on how to grow churches. And I'm not saying they're not well-meaning and have some good ideas. What I am saying, there are a lot of theories, but there's only one <coughs> biblical pattern. Okay? Now this is the argument I'm making here with this lesson, this series, hopefully a book and a workbook later on. The fact that a particular church, even one that is a church of Christ, is growing does not necessarily mean that it is organized according to the New Testament pattern. My point is that for unlimited growth to be possible, you need to be following the New Testament pattern for it. Just because a congregation has one or two thousand members doesn't mean that it has reached its true potential. I sat in a meeting at Oklahoma Christian, I was part of a uh, a task force on church growth and development. And uh, some of the guys that were sitting around, I won't mention names, but they were the pulpit guys and elders and so on and so forth of some of the largest churches in the churches of Christ, of, of all of our congregations. And you know what their complaint was? These are guys that, that are churches that have 3,000 people. You know what their complaint was? We want to grow. <laughs> they were complaining because they wanted to grow. They saw the potential and they said, it's not right that we have so many people, so much talent, so much money. We're not growing. Like we're growing at 2% or 2.5%. What's wrong? See what I'm saying? Just because you, you drive by and see this big, humongous church building doesn't mean that the people inside think that they've reached their potential. And the answer for them was, yeah, the reason you're only doing 2 to 4% is because you're not using the biblical pattern. You're using your ideas and also you're taking advantage of some of uh, some, uh, you know, it helps if you happen to be a congregation next to a 2,000, you know, 2,000 Christian student next to a university. You know, if you're next to Abilene or if you're, if you're the church near Pepperdine, you know, you know, when you've got 10,000 Christians and 500 faculty people who are members of the church or whatever, if you're the congregation next door, you're going to be large no matter what you do. But it doesn't mean that you're following the New Testament pattern. So here's my main point. 
When it comes to the issue of growth or size, for a New Testament church, a restoration church, the goal is not just to grow, the goal is unlimited, unlimited growth. And unless we're organized and prepared for unlimited growth, we're not fulfilling the New Testament teaching, the criteria, the pattern uh, that a New Testament ought to be in the area of growth. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to say, that there's a pattern for it, we need to be following it if we want the type of growth that it promises. The second thing I want to say is, New Testament organization comes before unlimited growth. Think of church organization as the foundation for a structure. If you have a faulty you know, foundation, you know, if the foundation's too small, it won't be able to sustain a very large building, right? Um, if you have one that does not take into account the potential structure that it will be called on to support. Uh, these inadequate types of foundations will eventually be the cause of the collapse of the structure, uh, the limiting of the size of the structure on the foundation that's too small, and the necessary changes in initial design of the structure itself in order to accommodate. In other words, you've got, to build a, you've got to build a foundation that will support the structure that you've designed. Well, if you're designing a structure that has unlimited potential, you have to have the right kind of foundation that will sustain that. That's my point. So God has mandated that there will be no end or limit to the growth of His church. Of course, the exception that proves the rule is that the church will stop growing only when Jesus returns, but not before. And so God has provided a foundational and organizational pattern for that church, which will be one of His own design without human error. In other words, the pattern that we follow to grow our church, if it's God's pattern, then we're, you know, we, we, we won't have a faulty design. There won't be a flaw in the system that'll bring everything crashing down at some point. It'll be one that will support any size church. I'm not saying this congregation here in Ponca City, uh, uh, when we're talking about unlimited growth, could have 60,000 members. You, know, you, you can't have a congregation that's bigger than the size of the city, let's put it that way, but Ponca City could be a church that has planted 100 churches. It could be in the business of planting churches everywhere, you know, unlimited. Generation after generation, it just becomes a church that plants churches, so that's growth too. You know, like the size of the local congregation remains steady at a certain size in relationship to its surroundings, but its growth is measured in how many other churches it's planted, how many missionaries it's sent out, and so on and so forth. That's growth too, that's unlimited type of growing. And also, it is a church that is geared to, uh, to uh, exist in any type of uh, 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 culture, any time, any place, and also it's geared for reproduction and multiplication. Uh, you know, one of the big, I won't mention which one, but one of the big churches there, the, one of the people that were complaining about that, um, their mistake, their mistake in, in their thinking process was they wanted simply to bloat out. In other words, we've got 2,000, we'd like to have 5,000, know, which meant you know, knocking buildings down and you know, buying land and two millions of dollars of commitment, when, when in reality their thinking should be, look, we already have a couple of thousand people, we already have 600,000 bucks in the bank you know, sitting there. The answer was kind of apparent to me, hey, start planting churches. There are plenty of towns that don't have churches. There are plenty of states that are not plenty of countries. You want to plant churches? Go up to Quebec. You know, eight million people, five churches of Christ. Eight million. So, what, so here in the Bible Belt, should we have a church that wants to go from 3,000 to 6,000? Wouldn't it be a little more profitable to plant 100 churches? That's growth. So God has also provided the blueprint or the pattern for this church organization in His Word, 
and situated it in such a way that it demonstrates to us that in order to achieve unlimited growth potential, we must first organize the church according to the foundational pattern He has provided in His Word. In other words, He teaches us how to organize the New Testament church. And I need to tell you, brothers and sisters, organization of the church for ministry goes far beyond men do the preaching and are the elders, we don't use instruments, you know, it goes far beyond that. Those are okay, those are the basics, those are the, that's the beginning part, but that, those are not the things that cause the growth. Okay? So without New Testament organization of the church, you can have growth, you can even have tremendous growth, but you cannot have unlimited growth. And when it comes to growth, the Bible mandates that we be organized to handle unlimited growth. OK, so there you have it, the reasoning behind the title of this lesson. Unlimited growth, that's what God wants from you. You. Unlimited growth, that's what He wants from you. And then the New Testament pattern for church organization and growth, that's how we go about achieving what God wants. Okay? All right, so much for an explanation of the title and some of the thinking behind the ideas that I'm proposing concerning church growth. In the remaining time for this session, let me summarize briefly the New Testament pattern for church organization which prepares and promotes unlimited growth. Here are two main principles, all right? You just, what you just got, that was the preliminary. Now we're getting to the meat of the matter. Two main ideas, okay? Number one, principle. Organize and train the church to function effectively and simultaneously in the five areas of biblical ministry. That's the first principle of unlimited growth. Somebody says, what do we do? Well, how do we start? You, you, train, you organize and train the church to function effectively and simultaneously, and I'll explain why that's important, in the five areas of biblical ministry. There are only five areas of biblical ministry. I've done this with groups everywhere and I say, go ahead, name anything you do in the church and I'll show you where that fits into one of the five biblical ministry. Anything you want, go ahead. We'll, we'll have that little exercise in, the, in a while. So that's the first principle. The second principle is the church grows in proportion to its organization and effectiveness in carrying out the five ministries outlined in Acts chapter 2. Somebody said, you've been talking all morning about you know, the biblical way. The bi well, where's the Bible for it? Well, the Bible for it is in the book of Acts chapter 2. Remember last night I said to you, the inside of the New Testament church, like the guts of it, the heart of it, where do you find that? You find that in Ephesians. The outside, the mechanics of it, how it works, which levers are, corrected, are connected to which other levers. You know, how does the machinery work? That's in the book of Acts. And that's what we're going to look at today. There are five areas of ministry demonstrated in Acts chapter 2. And my point here is when the church learns how to organize and function effectively in these five ministries, it creates an environment for healthy, unlimited biblical growth that God Himself will provide. All right, so let's go over these five in detail. Uh, uh, rather, uh, uh, let me just go over these five quickly and then in our next session we'll, we'll kind of go a little deeper here because I want to give you an overview, okay? So there are five and only five biblical ministries. They're in Acts chapter two. The first one is evangelism. Acts chapter 2, verses 14 to 41. Here it says, now when they heard this, you were familiar with this passage, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words, He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received His word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. 
So what's the first of the five biblical ministries? Well, evangelism, duh. Preaching to the lost with a view to their response of faith and obedience. There are different approaches, different cultures, different tools, but this ministry always has the same message and the same objective. We support a, a, a man, a preacher, he's a circuit preacher in Africa, in Kenya, in the Maru province, and he teaches at the college there, and he circuit preaches maybe seven or eight churches, right? I mean, you couldn't find a more different culture than you know, Ponca City and Maru, Kenya. Totally different culture, okay? And yet, what do you think this guy is doing? He's explaining to the lost that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for them and rose again from the dead, and if they need to believe in Jesus, repent of their sins, and be baptized. Well, wait a minute, isn't that what we're doing over here? You know, Hal and, and, and Bobby and I, we came here in two vans and lugging all our equipment and all that kind of stuff. He doesn't have a van, the roads are too bad. He has a motorbike. The church in Choctaw bought him a brand new motorcycle because that's how he gets from village to village, to play, small town to small town, you know, on a motorbike. Different culture, different place, different language, same message, same objective. Same objective, that those who hear him will repent and be baptized. That's the number one ministry of the church. We'll talk about that a little more later on. All right, second ministry of the church, education. Acts 2.42, it says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, preaching, the, uh, excuse me, teaching the saved to obey all of Jesus' commands. In a nutshell, that's ministry number two. They repent, they're baptized, now they have to be taught. They have to be taught the things of Christ. They don't only have to be taught the things of Christ, they have to be taught how to obey the things of Christ, how to do the things of Christ. I mean, I can say that in one sentence, but you, those of you especially who are Bible school teachers and so on and so forth, you know that that's not an easy task. It's, it's years, right? But that's the second ministry of the church, teaching the words of Christ to, to, to the saved. Third ministry of the church, fellowship. And they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Equally important ministry, the integration of the members into one another, into the body. That's fellowship, fellowship. It's an equally important and necessary ministry for unlimited growth. Again, I'm just touching the service. I'll go a little deeper in the next session. Fourth area of ministry, um, a fellowship, excuse me, it said here, I didn't read it all, it said everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. The fourth, uh, area is uh, worship. Acts 2.42c. In one verse he, he, he just gives three different areas of ministry. Public and private adoration of God needs to be taught, needs to be encouraged, needs to be organized. Uh, uh, Luke says uh, that the, the, um, they continually devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer, the idea of the saints being together for that. And then the fifth area is service, Acts 2.45, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. The pooling of resources of the church to meet the needs of the disciples and the community at large. There you have them, those are the five areas of biblical ministry. They're not six, they're not four, they're not twelve, there are only five. They are outlined briefly in the book of Acts, in Acts 2, and then elaborated on throughout the rest of the New Testament. Now, <clears throat> the relationship of all of these five ministries to each other and ultimately to the growth of the church is expressed in verse 47. Watch. It says, they were praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Careful now, 
careful, we're hitting the sweet spot. Note that the very last sentence in this passage ties everything together. Watch. They were, they were busy preaching to the lost and baptizing repentant sinners. They focused on teaching the new disciples to obey Christ's teaching. They provided encouragement and opportunity for fellowship and for worship, and this led to a natural outpouring of love seen in Christian service of all kinds. And what was the final outcome of these things working together? Jesus added to their number. Brothers and sisters, that's numerical growth. I've worked at congregations where I sat at a, you know, meetings where people were like a planning meeting and people would say, OK, next year, you know, 2004 or whatever it would be. Next year, our goal is 40 baptisms. Wrong. Well, we don't set baptisms as a goal. Now, if, if, if I would have said, OK, next year, we're going to have four gospel meetings. Oh, OK. You see, you see the difference? My job as the, uh, an evangelist, your job, uh, various ministries that you have, is to work out things, ministries, projects, services within each of these five ministries and just let God add the people. He will add the people. I guarantee you He will add the people. And again, we're going to talk about how that happens in another lesson. So when we boil it all down, we see a very simple spiritual equation that comes forth. And here it is. Ministry equals growth. The more ministry you have, the more growth you have. The less ministry you have, the less growth you have. Simple as that. Simple as that. And some people say, well, wait a minute, we got plenty of ministries. We got the quilters, we got this, we, got, you know, we give food to the poor and so on and so forth. And that may be true. But remember I said you have to have all five ministries working. And they all have to be working simultaneously. You know, we talked about the plane. Again, pilots, please forgive me for my ignorance. But it seems to me that when you're going to fly a plane, you need you know, a, little, a little two engine job. You, know, to, you need to get both engines going before you think of you know, going down the runway. I've never heard a pilot say, well, I'll start engine number one there and we'll start rolling down the, the thing. And then when we get to 10,000 feet, we'll see if that second engine is really working this morning. You know, we, don't, <laughs> we don't do it like that, do we? We have a checklist, this going, that going, this working, that working, all the engines, blah, blah, blah. blah. OK, now everything is working simultaneously and we get what? We get lift. Well, in the church, the same thing. Those five ministries have to be operating at the same time before you start to get lift off. And the lift off is church growth. So when we organize and execute the New Testament pattern of ministry, which is our part of the equation, God will provide the growth, which is the Spirit's part of the equation. The growth potential for this, brothers and sisters, is unlimited. This is not legalism, this is not works, but rather faith working according to God's direction in His Word. All right, one last thing, then we'll stop for two minutes. Just uh, not our coffee break, just two minutes. If you need to get some water, use the restroom and then go right into our second session. I want to finish this session with an example of a local congregation that implemented these ideas and the results that they had. Now in the state of Oklahoma, where there are approximately 600 congregations of the Church of Christ, of these, now I'm, I'm quoting stats from uh, in Choctaw in the year 2000. Okay, we'll start there. Of these 600 congregations, the Choctaw congregation where I was working for about seven and a half years was in the year 2000 second only to the Memorial Road Church, which is next to OC, uh, in sustained growth percentage for six years in a row. Second to Memorial Row, six years in a row. Now most denominations are in decline, but when there is growth, the national growth average for all types of churches in America, I told you last, uh, last night, right, 
three to five percent. That's the normal rate of growth. You know, if you take all the people that have come in and, and subtract all the people that have left for whatever reason, that's your net growth. The net growth of churches, any kind, in the U.S. of A, three to five percent. The Choctaw congregation experienced a net 15 to 20 percent growth rate beginning in 1994 when we slowly began to implement and refine this particular approach to church organization and growth and it grew to over 500 in attendance. When I went there in 93, attendance was around 200 to 225. When I left, it was over 500. We had to add, was it 10, 15,000 square foot, renovate the entire building to make room for that many people. Um, I went to work in California, left Choctaw in good terms. You know, I had other things that I wanted to accomplish. And I went to work for a church in California in San Diego, the Canyon View Congregation. I worked there not a long time, from 2001 to 2003. We implemented the same system, had the same results, even though Canyon View is an urban church. I mean, Canyon View in San Diego is an urban church, all right? And Choctaw, especially around 2000, was very much a kind of a country church. Very different places, very different culture, very different approach to things. And yet, as long as we implemented the New Testament pattern, we got the results. By 2003, their growth rate was 15 to 20 percent. Um, um, then I, uh, my wife and I went back to Montreal to do mission work, <laughs> excuse me, to do mission work for a small mission church there that we had planted many years ago that were having trouble. They were down to like 20 people. When we had left, they were 100. They were down to 20. So we decided to move back to Canada and go back into mission work. Again, implemented these principles uh, and in the six years or so that we were there, uh, they experienced a 10 to 15 percent growth rate. Um, I went back to work, very unusual. I was the pulpit guy at uh, Choctaw, left to be the pulpit guy at Canyon View, left and went and did mission work in Canada, came back to Choctaw as the education and media minister. They had a very good pulpit minister still there, Marty. Marty Kessler, he and I work well together. I have other things that I want to do other than do pulpit work. I want to do this kind of work. And yet we reviewed and reestablished those ideas that we had for a New Testament pattern, New Testament pattern for growth. And the Choctaw congregation since 2011 has experienced a 10 to 15 percent growth rate. Again, somebody said last night, you know, wow, why, why can't we have a hundred percent growth rate? Yeah, why not? Be great. But I'm thankful that Jesus said, you know, you know the harvest, sometimes 30, sometimes 60, sometimes a hundredfold. So it's possible the hundredfold, but a lot of times it's 60 or it's 30 or it's 20. What I'm saying to you is, if it's beyond five, you are really growing beyond the national average. So if you, if you did your, you know, next year you looked at your thing and say, hey, we grew at a rate of seven and a half percent, good, good. You're growing, that's real growth. Next year after that, nine percent, 11 percent, 15 percent. That's good, that's excellent. All right, last two things, we'll take a five minute break. Number one, effective and simultaneous. The five ministries of the church need to be carried out effectively, which means biblically, and at the same time, they all have to be working at the same time. It's like a car. If you've only got two pistons, the car will go, but you know, it'll be chugging along. You've got to have all pistons firing. And then the second thing, ministry equals growth. If we minister, the Lord will add the growth. More ministry, more growth. 